Happy International Women's Day. Look, happy International Women's Day. Last year I said happy, happy Reckoning Day, um, but this year I'm going with Happy International Women's Day and Happy Call to Action Day. So, you know, keeping the momentum going, I think. I'm really happy that you, you've started with this because I always go into International Women's Day with a slightly are you conflicted state of mind. It is a celebration and it's a, an opportunity to take stock and recognise how far we may have come, although it's such small steps that sometimes you go, ugh, what are we celebrating? Well, I'm very busy always around International Women's Day, which seems to be International Women's Day weeks mm -hmm. these days. And I'd be quite happy if we just declared it like many other countries do, a national holiday and had a day off and women could sleep in, mm -hmm. maybe not have to work so hard. But of course, the reality is there are good reasons to commemorate the gains that we've made. Um, but of course, I think for many of us, it's a reminder of how far we have yet to go. And I think uh, while we can all be a little conflicted, sometimes people feel, you know, a superficial celebration with breakfasts or cupcakes may not necessarily be the best thing for the women's movement. I'm a big fan of networking and sisterhood, and I love the idea of us getting together uh, to support each other and hopefully um, work out what we've got to do next in order to create better opportunities for uh, women and girls in particular. I also, I'm, I'm glad that you say that because I often go, well, we are in Australia, even though we are still, of course, working so hard on critical things like women's safety and ending gendered violence and, you know, things that are absolutely critical, really relative to the rest of the world, um, we're in a place where we are able to have breakfasts and lunches and, and, you know, our girls can go to school. And sometimes it feels like really, are, are we having any impact here in what we're doing? Absolutely. And a lot of the work around International Women's Day in Australia is organised by uh, UN Women. And so a lot of the proceeds from events and breakfasts, for example, actually go towards uh, life-saving, indeed life-changing work for women and girls in the region and beyond. So sometimes those breakfasts that you attend and you wonder, mm, am I really having an impact in Australia or beyond? You actually are. And that's not to say there's not a lot. We oh, gosh, we've got to do so much work in our own country. As we've seen in the last couple of years, uh, we're certainly not immune from the issue, the pervasive issue of uh, violence against women and children. Uh, we're certainly not immune from long-standing, seemingly intractable issues like, you know, gender pay gaps or lack of women's representation in decision-making institutions, uh, in corporate Australia. And we know, particularly in light of the COVID pandemic, that women's lives and many of the inequalities that we face have actually been exacerbated by the pandemic. So yes, we've got some serious issues to tackle and certainly a breakfast or a day is not going to change that. But anything that focuses uh, the energy and the attention, particularly of policymakers and those who are in power, that's not a bad thing. And Natasha, you mentioned the, the impact of the, the pandemic. And one of the things that we were told was that it's the financial pressures of the pandemic that saw a spike in the cases of domestic violence, specifically with women in Australia. But in the context of the sort of the broader discussion, is it because women are still seen as the cooks, the cleaners, the carers? Are we still focusing about women's roles in, in that context? Is that the problem? Very much so. So all over the world, including in our country, uh, the pandemic uh, exacerbated those traditional rigid uh, gender roles and stereotypes. Uh, we saw uh, women many in many occasions on the front line. So, you know, the caring roles as teachers, as cleaners, uh, health workers, of course, as well as, you know, looking after not only children uh, in some cases or elderly parents. Those roles were absolutely exacerbated. And I know that some people will come in and say, but hang on, we actually saw research and evidence that men had to do more caring work during the pandemic. And that's true, but still women's roles were disproportionate when it came to those unpaid caring roles. And in particular, some of those under-rewarded, often low-skilled or considered low-skilled 
um, roles in our community. So the pandemic made inequalities around the world worse, uh, particularly for people who were poorer, uh, people with disabilities, people already marginalised, and women and girls generally. And I can, you know, the issue particularly of violence against women and girls around the world, you know, UN women call this the shadow pandemic um, because frightening, extraordinary levels uh, of violence against women, whether that was um, in, you know, early enforced marriages increasing um, by about 10 million is the prediction by the end of the decade as a consequence of the pandemic, right through to what we saw even in Australia with um, online violence, uh, which, you know, over the Easter holiday alone uh, in the first year of the pandemic, we saw a 600% increase in reporting of online violence. So really across the board, the pandemic has made lives much, much harder um, when it comes to women and girls. And that's something that we've got to tackle globally, but we've also got a lot of work to do here. Natasha, you were the founding chair of Our Watch and your work, you know, in, in preventing violence against women is, is extensive. Um, and I, I suppose we're all similar in that we're despairing. It feels as though nothing really changes. What are we doing wrong? What aren't we doing? Things are changing. So please take some heart because even, what, 10 years ago, we didn't always talk about violence against women and children in, a, in the context of gender equality. And that's something that has changed. People have recognised now that there's almost this inextricable link between gender inequality and violence, this kind of violence. We're now recognising if gender inequality is at the core of the problem, hey, gender equality is at the heart of the solution. And by that, I mean, you know, tackling rigid gender stereotypes, tackling the underlying causes, you know, the attitudes and behaviours that give rise to this violence in the first place, whether that's limits on women's independence, whether it's, you know, uh, male peer relationships that uh, celebrate disrespect or consider women, you know, inferior. All of these things we're now starting to recognise are linked. And so the good thing is, and you know you've been involved in some of this work, we can look at solutions. And that means looking at respectful relationships education in schools you know it means workplaces where women are equally valued supported respected promoted it means looking at the ways that we advertise it's looking at representation of women and men non-binary however we identify in terms of our parliaments and other institutions of power so we've worked out that there are things that we can do in fact everywhere we live love learn, work and play, we can start to engender respect, equality, and hopefully as a consequence, uh, eliminate violence. But it takes a long time because as we know, uh, things don't change overnight. Policies, legislation, reform, that's not enough. Cultural change is the biggie and that's something we're working towards. So take some heart because we are recognising the problem. We understand the solutions. Now we need the goodwill and we need time to make the change. Natasha, if we focus on the, the education aspect uh, and look at schools specifically, if that's the place where we tackle respectful relationships, we've also got problems there as well. I mean, we just have to think about, you know, that elite school, St um, Kevin's, and, you know, there was an in independent inquiry into that school and it found that the elite school was actually... It, it, it was behaving in a way that was sexist and, and misogynistic. So do we really need to shake our education system to the core and, and sort of break the model and then rebuild it from scratch? That's a really good point. The one thing I say is because this is so multifaceted, it's one thing to address one aspect and education is critical. We know that, you know, the younger, the better you get age appropriate, you know, respectful relationships, education, the more likely you are to understand, you know, how things work and how you can model and present ethical, healthy, you know, equal relationships. But you know what, if those kids are getting different messages at home, that doesn't necessarily make it any easier to ensure that you have behavioural change. You know, for example, at home, I may, you know, preach to my children, much to their, probably their disdain these days, you know, how about gender equality is important and boys and girls are equal or it doesn't matter how you identify, equality is key. 
if you get a different message on the sporting field from your coach, you know, who once said to my son, you know, aren't you a mummy's boy or don't, you know, kick like a girl, then you've got other, you know, it's, it's this interacting layers that are so important. So yes, education is critical. It's the great equaliser. It always has been. But workplace, what we watch on TV, what we hear on the radio, what we see on the sporting field, all of those things, including the kind of relationships that we model as parents or caregivers, all of that makes the difference. And you get to see how complex and how hard it is to get all those things working together. Natasha, I was I was blessed enough to uh, interview Elizabeth Broderick and uh, she was telling me that her approach when she established Male Champions of Change was very much around finding through compassion an understanding of that person's position because she yeah. said you can't change someone's opinion. It, it's just, you know, it's going to end up in conflict. So I wonder what is your approach when you're having a conversation and you feel that there is a point that you need to make, how do you go about it? Well, of course, as a former politician, of course I think I can change opinions, but uh, <laughs> that might be a little um, arrogant and there might be evidence to the contrary, actually, now that I think about it. Um, I think the work that we were doing through Our Watch and Our Watch continues to do wonderful work, the National Foundation to Prevent Violence Against Women and Their Children, really was predicated on the issue of cultural change. And we learned that attitudes and behaviours have to change, but they're different. You might think one thing, but behave a certain way. So what I mean by that is, you know, they're not linear. Um, for example, we've seen a primary prevention approach to smoking, to skincare in Australia. All of those things have shown that, you know, population-wide change is possible, but it's a combination of making something almost socially embarrassing and inappropriate and then actually changing people's minds about oh i can't say that about women um uh but i also don't want them to think that way either if that makes sense so changing attitudes is really hard and it takes a long time behavior is a good first step so yeah i think you can appeal to people um you know hopefully people will want to do the right thing there's a lot of criticism of course when um people say something including our prime minister like, you know, because I'm the father of a daughter or, you know, my, my wife said this. But the reality is sometimes those things do have an impact on people's behavioural change and their attitudes. I would hope that as good citizens and humans, everyone would recognise that equality is in all our interests. I would hope that corporate Australia, just as parliamentarians, would recognise that uh, countries can't function using only half the population's talent and resources. So there's even a business case for gender equality, let alone the prevention of violence against women and children. Um, so I would hope that we can appeal to people's good sense and their hearts and their minds on this issue. But sometimes, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I do despair because I just think, why haven't we solved this already? You know, innately, you know, violence against women is not, an inherent biological condition. You know, it's it's not natural. So we can prevent it, we can stop it. Um, and that's the good news. Violence against women and children is preventable, but we've got to have the goodwill, the resources, and of course, sometimes generational change in order to make that happen. But do I want it to happen faster? You bet, you bet. Natasha, you mentioned that there's even a, a business case for yeah. Uh, tackling DV and and if we like crunch the numbers, it's it's costing us over twenty billion dollars a year. So putting the the moral argument aside, there, there's a real cost involved in not stamping it out. I yeah. mean, we, we've seen during the pandemic how quickly we can respond to things, how quickly we put in policy and practices to respond to to COVID nineteen. Yet we're dragging our feet when it comes to something as large as domestic violence. So what is it that that's actually stopping us putting these policy practices into place? Is it po the possibility that perhaps prominent men may be dragged into this conversation, that their reputations may be tarnished? Oh, there are a few things there. First of all, one thing I learned very early, people don't relinquish power and they certainly don't do it easily. We need women in positions of power. We need women recognised and represented and reflected throughout society, especially in powerful positions. And that means men sharing power at best or relinquishing power. 
So I think that's really challenging for people. The other thing is women's issues, so-called, and this is a human issue, let's be honest, um, you know, men's, you know, perpetration of violence against women and girls is actually a men's problem when you think about it. However, the issues affecting us have traditionally not been given the same degree of importance and respect and resources as other issues in society. And you're quite right to make that sort of analogy. You know, I've seen politicians and, you know, ministers with a stroke of a pen change ideas, policies overnight. I've seen millions of dollars, you know, allocated instantly to issues that are considered emergencies. Well, I've always maintained that the issue of violence against women and children in Australia is a national emergency. So if we had the goodwill, the political will, yes, we could change more and we could change more overnight. We could turbocharge this particular issue. So when you ask why, there are many, many complex reasons. But yes, in a very sort of simplified manner, people are challenged by it. It confronts people's idea of, you know, the traditional roles in society. And certainly when it comes to power, people like keeping power and it's a real challenge for people to share it. I was shocked by that through my life in politics, um, but at least now I'm realistic enough to know that uh, it's not just about people giving power to women or to any other marginalised or underrepresented or underrepresented group. It's about us claiming it. And I think that's what we've seen in the last couple of years, a new movement, a momentum, particularly led by young women and women from diverse backgrounds, that excites me. I feel that there's a momentum for change uh, and I, that gives me great hope for the future, to be honest. Uh, I agree entirely. Natasha, I have to say the last year has been extraordinary as we yeah. all have been caught up with this incredible movement and yes, led by such strong, outspoken women who, my yeah. God, at that age, I did not have that kind of courage. Um, are we going to see a response from our leaders? Because that's why we're angry. When you say yeah. when you say a stroke of a pen, I think nationally we all know instinctually that they have that kind of power and they're choosing not to give us that stroke of the pen. Are we going to see change there? Oh, I feel we're going to see change. Um, I think that long gone are the days where certainly this next generation, younger women particularly, but when I say younger women, I actually think it's this wonderful, diverse and different group of young people. Again, however people identify. I think there's a real understanding now that gender stereotypes and rigid gender roles are a little passe. You know, all these things that did us no favours, these young people are focused on equality and ethical, healthy relationships and commitment. So at some point, they're just going to start voting people out of positions <laughs> of power. And whether that's in a formal political parliamentary sense or whether that's, you know, what's happening with corporate Australia or any kind of community groups, I think it's going to be a very interesting transition. So, yes, have some hope. Um, and that's not to disregard the work of men and women and others who've gone before because you really do build on the work of many, many people. And I were, I'm always cognizant of the fact that, you know, I was part of a women's movement that had been going on for, for decades and decades and decades before me. And the best thing that you can possibly do is build on so that you can make it easier, better for the next generation. So that's the plan. But I, I just love the fact these young people, they're not... Mm. They're not taking any shit. It's just oh, it's amazing. really amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the future's in some good hands, I believe. Yeah, I agree. Um, so just finally, Natasha, because I know you're super busy, but one of the reasons why you're busy is because uh, in 2020, you were elected by the General Assembly of the United Nations as a member of the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Effectively, I'm calling you our chief feminist um, yeah. because, you know, that is that is a critical organisation doing amazing work globally, but a lot of us probably have never heard of it. Can you just explain what that organization is set up to do and what your role is? Well, with a catchy acronym like CEDAW, I'm surprised <laughs> you haven't heard of it. But um, no, seriously, it is the preeminent women's committee in the world. And you're right, its relevance and is not always known um, by many people, including some governments. But essentially, our role is to keep 
states parties or countries really who are signatories to the convention uh, that underpins CEDAW, we keep them accountable. We provide member states guidance in the ways that they can create better lives for women and girls. And we do that through a series of articles through the convention, which tackles everything from the issue of exploitation of women, the issue of violence, of stereotypes, issues to do with legal access to justice, marriage, and all those issues that are associated with the legal rights of women and girls around the world. We are actually, you know, in the box seat when it comes to talking to countries about what they can do, but also keeping countries accountable when they're doing things that are not only questionable or inhumane. So it's a lot of work. Um, typically, United Nations with multilateralism, you've got a lot of different regions, geographies and people to uh, work with. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been hard. It's interesting when you're doing something at my age and you're realizing that it's very new and very hard but it's important because I actually see how we can change lives for the better and that makes me excited um, but sometimes yeah two steps forward one step back but that's certainly the women's movement isn't it mm. but I do feel as though you're working at that incredibly high policy level but you're you're also someone who we can relate to as you know walked a path that we're sort of walking as well and so there's a sense of you know very real inspiration that you're bringing to us um in the work that you do natasha that is very generous and probably just the little flip that i needed to uh, <laughs> keep going because i have to say and i'm sure you and your listeners are feeling this too it's a really challenging time in the world right now uh the issue of the rights of people generally in places like the Ukraine, but particularly women and girls in positions of conflict, uh, dealing with issues to deal, you know, for example, with Afghanistan. Uh, we've got a lot of confronting stories and, and, you know, circumstances with which we're dealing at the moment. So every little bit of positivity helps. So for those of you celebrating International Women's Day, don't feel guilty. Feel excited that we can commemorate some extraordinary changes that have taken place in our lifetimes and previously, but also let's feel re-energised and recommit to actually tackling some of the challenges and, um, you know, some of the obstacles that lie ahead of us. And I guess one last note on that is we do it reflecting our diversity and difference. So it has to be inclusive. It has to be diverse. It has to be intersectional. Otherwise, it's not really true equality. Well, thank you, Natasha Stotterspoor. It's been an absolute joy. We wish you a very you. wonderful International Women's Day. Thank you. Same to you. Happy sisterhood. Happy International Women's Day. <laughs>